This is episode 198 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Printing Human Tissues, Dr. Anthony Atala. Hey, everybody. This is Dr. Dalon James and Dr. Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge in stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today, we have a legend in tissue engineering, Dr. Anthony Atala from the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. He's on the podcast to talk about his research on growing human tissues and organs to replace those damaged by disease or defect. We've also got our usual roundup of highlights and stem cell news coming right up. But first, looking to stay current with the latest research and news in the field of cell biology, we'd like to remind our listeners to check out Stem Cell Science News, featuring the most recent top peer-reviewed research and review papers, as well as industry policy and science news. Stem Cell Science News provides a platform that allows researchers to stay up to date with their field while saving time. Subscribe for free at www.stemcellsciencenews.com. Arun, I want to kick off the roundup today with a bombshell in my field, reproductive medicine. And we alluded to it in uh, our coverage of the ISSCR 2021. So you can peek back at those video episodes on YouTube. This is a story from Katsuhiku Hayashi, who has made great strides originally from the Mitenori Saitu lab, uh, where they were creating germ cells from embryonic stem cells. And I think this was a seminal step forward in that effort. Um, And it's based on this idea in that the germ cells aren't a kind of self-contained unit in their ontogeny and development. In fact, they are created by a collaborative interaction in mice and in humans. um, There's the primordial germ cell that migrates down the midline and then colonizes the gonad. And when it gets there, it interacts with the somatic cells in the gonad and those instruct further proliferation and terminal differentiation towards a uh, kind of, you know, oogonia or spermatogonia. Um, in mice, this happens around E10, embryonic day 10, when the primordial germ cells colonize the genital ridge. Um, and upon sex determination, a little bit later on embryonic day 12 in the females, uh, the somatic cells of the ovary there they differentiate into these granulosa and interstitial cells. And along with the primordial germ cell, then an oocyte, they become this this organ or this rudiment called the follicle. And the follicle, the ovary, is what creates oocytes. They lie dormant until uh, puberty and sexual development, um, maturation, and then you have uh, follicular genesis that creates oocytes monthly, but the process actually takes a long time. We're not gonna get into that here in terms of creating that first rudiment, that unit of the follicle, it happens during development. And it's critically dependent on interactions from those somatic cells. And previously, uh, work from Hayashi and Sci2 labs have used uh, the influence of the somatic cells from actual fetal tissue. They take the, the primordial germ cells that they make from ES cells, but then they instruct those primordial germ cells or primordial germ cell-like cells, they call them, They instruct those with fetal uh, ovarian somatic cells from actual embryo. Um, And that's an issue. They also was, uh, Hayashi lab was able to do this in human, with human um, primordial germ cell-like cells, but ultimately had to use mouse fetal ovarian tissue, which obviously is never going to take flight clinically. It also, it raises some issues in terms of the fidelity of the instructions there from mouse to human. So, well, since that effort, the, the, the group and many groups have sought to create that somatic cell influence, either completely, a, you know, from recombinant cytokines, which is tough, or at least to create those cells from embryonic stem cells. And that's pretty much what Hayashi's group did here. Um, just to mention, he's at Kyushu University, uh, his own group now in Japan, no longer with Saitu Lab, obviously. He's been independent for years. Um, and here they were able to make throughout a series, they use like eight different reporters, Fox FL1, OSR1, Bracky Yuri, Fox L1, 
you know, the <laughs> NR5, A1, they had a whole feast of reporters. It was insane um, to, to find the path to get embryonic stem cells differentiated down to these fetal ovarian somatic cell-like cells. Wow, that's a mouthful. They call them fossil Cs, which is not <laughs> the best acronym either, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the proof is in the pudding here. They aggregate these fossil Cs with the PGL, PGCLCs that they generated before, and they enter meiosis. They generate functional oocytes capable of fertilization and development uh, to normal offspring that are fertile. So. This is a big deal uh, because now we're kind of out of the box. We don't have to count on any fetal tissue. Everything can be done in vitro from embryonic stem cells to create bona fide um, you know, gametes, uh, eggs in this case, which is a tremendous feat. Um, and it's gonna really foster a, a, a improved understanding of the process and even maybe perhaps one day, although I really doubt it. I've talked about it before, but I think it's, I don't know that we're ever gonna get to a safe enough place to be generating eggs from stem cells and then having that contribute to the germline of humanity forever. So it's gonna to be tough, I think, to get this into widespread clinical practice, but nevertheless, it's a, I think a testament to what I said when we talked about this in the ISSCR 2021, is that we're moving away from any dependence on fetal tissue, although fetal tissue research is still tremendously important. Um, now we're moving to a place where we can make everything uh, from cells in vitro in a way that's gonna quiet down any kind of ethical con concerns or constraints. Yeah, this is tremendous. It's one of those bombshell watershed papers, whatever you wanna call it, in the field of reproductive biology. And like you said, I think it goes along really nicely with the theme of the ISCR this year, which is using these in vitro models of mammalian development, the blast stories, the gastroloids, all the cool stuff we talked about on the show. Um, yeah, and this is beautiful because, well, you're taking, I guess, the body out of the equation, no fetal tissue required. This is all in vitro and ex exceptionally powerful in that way. So you're a card-carrying developmental and reproductive biologist. So I'm going to ask you the, the million dollar question. How soon before the same kind of thing can happen from human embryonic stem cells or human iPSCs? I, I would have said it, it's going to take a while, um, just a short while back. But I think that all the pieces are in place. The, the hardest thing for me to get over was how Hayashi was able to reproduce his work that he'd done in mouse in human. I thought that the developmental timing would be very different. I mean, in, in a human ovary, it even takes to get from a primordial follicle, the dormant you know, unit that's implanted in the ovary during development, to get from that to a to an ovulated oocyte takes many months. You know, it's not just 30 days that people think of in the reproductive cycle. It takes months and months of development. Um, so I, I, relative to the mouse, which is much shorter. So I thought the timescales would be different and they, they aren't apparently. He was able to get uh, PGCLCs from human embryonic stem cells that re-entered meiosis and recapitulated a lot of the behaviors evidenced here in these mouse cells. So I think it's just a matter of him making the equivalent of these FOS LCs, which I'm sure he's already far along. I mean, I talked to him, he came mm. to visit us. I talked to him, it was five years ago, I think almost. Um, and he was already working in the human system uh, to try and he, oh, he works alongside with the human and the mouse um, to try and get there. So I think it's not going to be long now. I think it's going to be a, a matter of uh, just, a, just a, a year or two before we see the equivalent in human. And that's going to raise a feast of questions and issues and possibilities and nightmare scenarios. Right, Arun? Absolutely. And you know, it's coming. I love seeing you get excited about this stuff, man. This is like your wheelhouse. This is what hypes you up in the morning. So just to see that smile on your face, you know, gets me going, man. I'm just saying, just saying. So we're going to move on from a science paper to another science paper. This is actually a paper that came out in science, um, just like the Hayashi paper. And this is a, another paper that actually has taken the, the stem cell field by storm. Its uh, title is an isoform of Dicer protects mammalian stem cells against multiple RNA viruses. 
Okay, so this is a it's a basic science study, but it has a lot of downstream applications for antiviral defense and so on. So folks at the Francis Crick Institute, uh, this is coming from the lab of Caetano Reis e Souza, and first author here is Enzo Poirier. Uh, so the folks at the, um, the Francis Crick Institute were able to find this defense mechanism that's thought to have normally disappeared in mammals, at least from the way I learned it in developmental and cell biology. Uh, you know, we talk about RNAi, right? RNAi is really important because it's the way that plants and invertebrates usually defend against viruses. The mammalians, you know, mammalian systems, we evolved this interferon response to help alleviate viral infection. That's really important for, for you know, for our protection against viruses. But Apparently, the mammalian defense system, and in particular in stem cells, tissue stem cells, uh, it actually uses a form of dicer, which is the, the one of the critical components of RNAi, to actually protect against RNA viruses in the stem cells, exclusively in the stem cells. And the thought is maybe one day this could be exploited to develop new antiviral treatments, right? So it's, it's really neat because it's an evolutionary story. You're thinking about something like RNAi that may have been the precursor to the, all the mammalian antiviral mechanisms that we know about, but it's apparently it's still there. It's just hidden away in our adult stem cells and our tissue stem cells, okay? So we talk about, um, you know, basically what they did here is they looked at genetic material from mouse stem cells and also human stem cells and found that it has the, they have the instructions to create an isoform of dicer. Okay, not dicer itself, but this is what they called antiviral dicer or AVID, A-V-I-D. And it, it does the same thing, very similar thing to dicer, right? It can cut up RNA and prevent RNA viruses from actually replicating in those stem cells, in the adult stem cells, okay? So they took the you know, human and mouse adult tissue stem cells and exposed them to different types of RNA viruses. And of course, if you're gonna talk about an RNA virus experiment these days, you're gonna use coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. So they threw some coronavirus onto the uh, tissue stem cells and they found that the virus infected three times fewer stem cells when this avid disa isoform was present in the cells compared to when avid was actually removed. So that's kind of the definitive experiment that shows, yeah, this avid dicer is, is really critical for mediating this antiviral or uh, defense mechanism in our adult stem cells. So they also grew cortical organoids from mouse embryonic stem cells and found that when they infected these things with the Zika virus, which is known to, of course, impact brain development and uh, cortical organoids have been a great model to study Zika virus infection, the organoids with this avid defense uh, dicer isoform actually grew better. And so that tells you that the residual neuronal stem cells that are in those cortical organoids are able to be protected from the viral infection just by the presence of this avid isoform. And same thing, when the organoids were infected with the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, there are fewer infected stem cells in the organoids with the avid. Uh, but the important thing here, the other important thing here is that this seems like it's a stem cell exclusive mechanism. It doesn't look like this is actually happening in the differentiated somatic tissues. So it's something about the adult stem cells that enables them to have this innate antiviral RNAi like dicer mediated defense mechanism. That's just somehow one it's, it, it's lost during the differentiation process. So, you know, it's, it kind of blew my mind because it, it helps you rethink and retool your ideas about uh, RNAi. And apparently it's not, it, it's, it's not as exclusive to plants and invertebrates as you might like to think. So apparently mammals, mammalian stem cells in particular have some version of this. And I'd love to see where this work goes down the road. Yeah, uh, Mother Nature, right? The ultimate hoarder never gets rid of anything. <laughs> um, the the question I got asked, and of course, is what the heck is it doing? I mean, if it's some latent uh, activity that's redundant and unnecessary, or if it's actually providing or conferring some benefit. So I'm guessing they got it. Like, is there a way to to knock it out or to amplify it in a in a mouse? I'm sure they got those those studies going on right now. 
Yeah, in fact, their next work is actually creating a mouse model, which actually is AVID negative, right? So it's lacking this RNAi um, dicer isoform. So yeah, I mean, it's one of those stories that wants you know, helps you reflect on the power of nature and just how amazing evolutionary biology is. And the other aspect of this is that, you know, this also reminds me a lot of the CRISPR story, because what is CRISPR? CRISPR is an antiviral defense mechanism that's evolved by bacteria. So there's so many cool proteins and mechanisms that are just waiting to be harnessed by nature. You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's why we cover these basic stories is because it won't be long before you're seeing them applied in these more translational stories. And that's a good segue. We had two science stories that really got to the fundamental. And I think we're coming up with two science translational stories uh, from Arun and I mm -hmm. that are going to maybe talk about how that science is applied. Not that specific science, but science in general. All science today in the science journals, especially. <laughs> Um, this story, I'm taking a page uh, from Arun here, and then he's going to take it quickly back. Uh, in the cardiac space, not just you who loves the heart, my friend. Um, here we're talking about uh, engineering as well, uh, which is an exciting segue with our guest, who's one of the uh, forefathers of stem cell-based engineering approaches. Um, anyway, this is about engineered heart tissues, okay? So really, this is more about what makes the heart. And, and the, the thing that people don't appreciate as much about the heart is the dynamic force, right? They think about the heart as a muscle, pump, 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 pump. But the reality is that there's a lot of uh, differential biomechanical forces there. And the mechanical loads are, are of basically two major types, which is a stretch during chamber filling called the preload. And then there's the pressure that the heart's got to apply to eject the blood after, right? The afterload, okay? So you have the preload and the afterload. And those two dynamic forces are critical to normal heart function. In development one, you know, you have that force, biomechanical forces are actually influencing differentiation, maturation, and alignment of the cardiomyocytes and growth. Um, but also there's a lot of maladaptive changes downstream of biomechanical force like with hypertension or with myocardial infarction and other cardiomyopathies. Um, there's also something called arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy or ACM, um, where exercise like normal type of uh, adaptive hypertrophy that you'd see in the heart um, can lead to ventricular dilation and reduced contractility. So for those individuals, unfortunately, they're advised to just completely avoid any kind of competitive exercise, vigorous exercise or sports. Um, and half, uh, more than half of the, these cases of ACM, they're not idiopathic, they're due to specific mutations in uh, desmosomal genes, okay? Like desmoplakin, placoglobin, placophilin 2, desmoglain, blah, blah, blah. A lot of desmos and placos in there, all right? Um, so, you know, bottom line, there's this genetic, there's these genetic conditions that relate very specifically to uh, biomechanical loading. And you can study these types of things, the mechanical loading, um, with both adaptive and maladaptive changes, heart structure, you can study them in animals, but of course, the physiology there, the gene expression, the, the size of the animal, pharmacokinetics, the size of the heart, they're very different. So those are kind of limited. And more recently, there have been uh, efforts to go with these, you know, two-dimensional cell cultures of cardiomyocytes or microengineered surfaces, these muscular thin films using IPS derived cells, cardiomyocytes, which were actually um, created by, I remember Kit Parker mm -hmm. and uh, Adam Feinberg, who's a senior author on this paper in conjunction with Peter Vandermeer, Adam Feinberg now at Carnegie Mellon and Peter Vandermeer um, at the University of Groningen in uh, the Netherlands. So that's a distant collaboration. But anyway, a a Adam Feinberg, clearly he took the work on from this to use these, extend these mus muscular thin films. I don't know if you remember, but it was cardiomyocytes attached to this thin film and when they would contract, they would bend the film. Yeah. Um, and they used that, uh, Poo Lab at Harvard then used that technology with Kip Parker to model like Barr syndrome with IPS cells. But the problem there is that, uh, this is like five, six years ago, but then the, the, the problem is that these 2D cardiomyocytes are adhered to the surface. So they don't have, they're like 2D 
right? So they don't have the same coupling that you'd see in the physiological context of the heart. So of course, uh, in this collaboration with Vandermeer Feinberg, set out to get a more physiologically relevant 3D engineered heart tissue. We use the EHT engineered heart tissue here. Um, these, they call them these uh, dynamic EHT, um, which is a new model. Uh, and they, the way they make it, they integrate it with this elastic polydimethyl siloxane strip, right? And it allows them to, to preload and afterload and while they're doing, they can control both the preload and after, they can also measure uh, the strip bending using this pretty straightforward optical method. So it's like pretty basic, but you know, high concept, but like straightforward basic. Um, and they show that dynamic loading improves the function of wild type uh, engineered heart constructs. And that is the correlates with the magnitude of the force and improves the alignment. Um, contractility. And then they use the, the IPS cells of these ACM patients to model and show that indeed you can't get that disease state, the desmosome linked phenotype. You don't get it unless you use these dynamic EHT, essentially showing that T2D doesn't really recapitulate all the biomechanical inputs um, that would allow you to model disease. And without being able to model disease, you can't understand and potentially treat. So this is at once showing that having a more refined system gets you closer to physiology, just if you want to understand what the heart really looks like, and then it applies it in this IPSL model to, to really open the door towards a new, a new platform for understanding a disease that's, you know, keeping people on the bench. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you alluded to it. I think as a, an IPS cardiomyocyte biologist, I like this paper because it addresses a, a big criticism of two-dimensional IPS culture and IPS cardiomyocyte culture is that, you know, if you're trying to model an adult disease like heart disease and these diseases that have a really strong mechanical component, like you're really trying to study the mechanical dynamics of this disease, to do that in a two-dimensional culture just doesn't always make sense. Yeah, we can glean cool mechanistic insights about the, the transcriptional regulation of these cells in the context of disease. But if you're trying to study the heart, which is a really dynam mechanically dynamic pump, you have to use some of these advanced models. And so I, I think this is just a stepping stone towards you know, an even better set of models. And I, I think the limitation is as something I allude to a lot on the show is unfortunately accessibility, right? Not everybody can have these really advanced uh, three-dimensional tissue engineered approaches to properly study cardiac biology. And that's perhaps part of the reason that we, we do do two-dimensional cultures. They are cheaper, easier to work with, but hey, dream scenario down the road, everybody would be able to take advantage of these kind of advanced tissue engineered constructs. Yeah, I think you're right there is that maybe Part of the criticism there is you look at this, you're like, oh my gosh, you got to, you know, get a million dollars just to get your system running. Um, and only at these major institutes like Harvard or Carnegie Mellon could it maybe be possible. But I think that, that to address that, uh, the authors here really tried to emphasize that the, the, the output was, was relatively basic. You know, you didn't need high level electrophysiological monitoring equipment on a micro scale or anything. I think that while it was super high tech, uh, the idea was effectively how much is this thing gonna bend? Um, and yeah. that should relate to the force. So I, I liked that, which is it's, it, it's able to, it's the same way you, when you looked in you, your origin story, when you look down in the microscope and you see the beating cardiomyocytes, to me, that's, that's it's the same idea as like, you see it and you, re you realize the, the value of a thing just because it's so relatable and it's so, um, it's so clear. That's right. No model is perfect and we're just working on making them better one step at a time. And speaking of IPS cardiomyocytes, actually the next paper, the last paper from the roundup is coming from the new lab of actually a former mentor of mine and somebody who taught me a lot about IPS cardiomyocyte culture and endothelial culture back when I was a, a grad student in Joe Wu's lab. This is, this is coming from the lab of Dr. Mingxia Gu, who is a new assistant professor at Cincinnati Children's. Um, actually, this is, this is a paper, I think one of the last papers that she published when she was actually in the lab of Marlene Rabinovich at Stanford. Uh, so I don't think this is actually immediately from her 
new lab. This is actually a, this is, she's the first author on this paper, but coming from Ming Gu, now at Cincinnati Children's, and another science translational medicine article titled IPSC Endothelial Cell Phenotypic Drug Screening and In Silico Analyses Identify uh, Trifostin AG1296 for Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension. So we're talking about pulmonary hypertension, which is, uh, of course, a dangerous condition that can occur in newborns, folks with different heart defects. Uh, it's sometimes mistaken for asthma, but it's where you have blood vessels in the lungs that actually develop this resistance to blood flow. It's a little different from standard run-of-the-mill hypertension that you think about all the time when you think about like high blood pressure because of accumulated plaques and the arteries and all that kind of stuff. This is a little bit different. It's not always related to linked to, to diet per se, um, but the treatments aren't, they're there, but they're not always the most effective. So what they did here is they did a high throughput screen of 4,500 compounds at different stages of clinical development in a bunch of different doses. And of the compounds they found, they identified a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, AG1296, uh, as a further compound for, for lead investigation, which actually they able to uh, restore and improve pulmonary hypertension in a rat model. So that's critical, right? Anytime you do these screening approaches, if you find something that's effective and you're showing that it's effective in your in vitro endothelial cultures, like what uh, Ming Xia did here, you got to take it back to the animal model. You got to take it back to the rat model of pulmonary hypertension in this situation and see if it actually alleviates the phenotype, right? So in that way, it's, it's a pretty straightforward study. You're going from screening, identifying a compound, validating that compound in vitro with your endothelial cells, and then taking it into an animal model to, to further validate it. And of course, the next step is if you're able to find something that's alleviating symptoms of pulmonary hypertension in a rat model, in a mouse model, uh, you got to take it to clinic. And that's exactly what they're doing here, taking it down to clinical trials. So a pretty straightforward uh, drug screening study with another promising compound for pulmonary hypertension. I, this is refreshing. I mean, I never thought I would think that going kind of back to the future here, I thought we were done with all the, the 2D IPS drug screening stories. That's so like five years ago, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm I, like you said, uh, it's still while straightforward, no organoids or fancy engineered XYZ. Um, I think that it's refreshing to get back to something robust uh, where you can immediately look to the next stage, right? Where you can start testing something um, that let's be honest. I mean, everyone likes to, you know, poo poo the big pharma paradigm of drug development, but there's a lot of lives that have been saved and, and made better um, using this traditional approach. So I'm always happy to see a, a new drug enter the market for testing. Well, not, not every single <laughs> one. Uh, as you've seen in the news, they've been a little bit willy nilly, but it's always nice to see a candidate, especially for a disease that's so, you know, such a, such a, just ruined so many lives. Yeah, it's, it's honestly, I just don't know that much about pulmonary hypertension and talking with folks who do know a little bit more about it. I realized that there aren't a lot of great treatments for it. I mean, in contrast to run of the mill, regular hypertension that we have statins and all this kind of other stuff that you can modulate and, you know, restore some level of proper uh, blood pressure, right? But for pulmonary hypertension, it's a little bit different because the, the causes of the disease are a little bit different. There's often like a very genetic component to it. So it's cool to see this compound and hopefully it keeps progressing towards the clinic. Unmet need being met. Uh, you know, speaking of which, there's all these people out here looking to our guests with hope because he has kind of kicked open the door to this idea of any disease being treatable with cells and tissues printed. I wouldn't say he is a, a simplified, oversimplified as a printed, but um, you know, he's working on engineering tissues at large scale. We're gonna get to that in just a minute, but before we do, I have a message from Stem Cell Technologies. They've conducted a survey asking scientists to help highlight the hurdles to genome editing using CRISPR. You can read the survey report to learn about the most interesting insights on topics such as editing efficiency and downstream, downstream viability and how to overcome them in your research. Visit www.stemcell.com slash CRISPR survey results to learn more. And without further ado, we, we will get on to our guest, Dr. Atala. All right, everybody, today we have the special pleasure of inviting a true legend in the field, Dr. Anthony Atala. 
He is founding director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, also chair of the Department of Urology at Wake Forest University. Dr. Itala's main research focus is growing human tissues and organs to replace those damaged by disease or defect. He led the team that developed the first lab grown organ, a bladder, to be successfully implanted into a human. That was a story in The Lancet about 15 years ago now and he hasn't stopped working since. He now leads an interdisciplinary team of about 400 that's working to engineer more than 40 different replacement tissues and organs and to develop healing cell therapies. Dr. Itella, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's great to be with you. Yeah, it's good to see you again, Dr. Atala. And you've been involved at the intersection of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine for decades now, having worked initially for many years at Harvard before starting up a tremendous research operation at the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, or W Firm. So for most researchers, going from bench to bedside sounds like something that's a bit of a lofty goal and something for, to strive for long term. But you and W Firm have made some real you know, leaps and have made clinical translation a reality in multiple situations, not just a dream, but actually being able to transplant some of these tissue engineered organs, including a lab grown bladder, for example, into patients. So to start things off, why don't you give us an overview of W Firm, what W Firm and your team are working on right now, and perhaps what you're most proud of to be involved with right now at W Firm. Yeah, thank you, Ron. It's what, what a pleasure to be with you and see you again. Uh, you know, Dudley Firm is really uh, an institute that is kind of semi-freestanding in a way. We're part of Wake Forest, but the folks who work at the institute have their primary appointment here, which makes it very special because it means that people are really working together uh, in a teamwork manner, trying to get technologies to move to patients. And that's really the goal and the mission of the institute is to make patients' lives better through Regen Med. So by having... Uh, uh, this multidisciplinary team of folks, uh, basic biologists, uh, material scientists, chemical engineers, physiologists, pharmacologists, veterinarians, all working together and under one roof, uh, you know, where the, the responsibility is to the institute, not to uh, other departments, then you can really push these technologies forward. And that's what makes us, uh, you know, uh, so happy to come to work because people are working together in this teamwork uh, type of manner. Uh, and so at that way firm, really the goal is to keep bringing technologies to patients. And we do everything from the actual idea uh, to the concept, to the proof of concept, to the bench top work, to the preclinical work, all the way to production of the clinical uh, delivery uh, therapy that's gonna go to the patient. Uh, we also run the clinical trials out of the Institute. The only thing we don't do at the Institute is actually treat the patient. Uh, but we, in fact, coordinate the clinical trials from this place as well. Yeah, the, um, I mean, you guys, you're such a trailblazer yourself and, and all the scientists working under you, I think they just, they break through with the, with the big idea, right? Show that it's possible and that's how you have to lead. And then it's for everyone else to fill in. And, and the, the tissue engineered bladder story uh, that I mentioned there and the room mentioned, that was about 15 years ago. Um, and the idea of autologous mesenchymal cell types for, for therapy, you know, both the bona fide approaches as well as the more scandalous approaches that have been in the news um, over the past few decades, it's been in play for, for some time now. Uh, so I ask, you know, you, you, you've led, you've shown it's possible, um, you know, with the bladder and, and you're working on more than 40 other types of tissues, organs. Uh, so I ask, are autographs, though, of, of relatively simple tissues like bladder and trachea, for example, are they more commonplace? You just don't hear about them in the news because they're, they're, not, they're not breakthrough tech anymore? Or are there still major obstacles to their integration and more standard uh, clinical practice? And also for, for things like uh, skin, uh, like engineered skin, which I know has been another big target. Um, for like plastic surgery, which you could think there's a, a lot of commercial demand. Are those things like more commonplace? We just don't hear about them as much now in, in, in popular science? Yeah, so, you know, the technologies keep progressing. They really do, you know, and, and we have, uh, this year we're implanting actually our 16th application of the technology in patients. Um, so 
we've implanted 15 already applications of the technology. Um, and so, but it is a long process. You know, people don't realize often how long it takes to go through the regulatory process and especially in technologies where you really need to be patient. So our strategy has always been, if you look at all our early work, we waited at least until we had at least five year follow-up before we went to a phase two clinical trial uh, or, or the next phase of the trial. And we did it for the simple reason that we really did not know how these technologies would fare long-term. And so the responsible thing to do was to make sure that we treated a small number of patients that we had a five-year follow-up at least before we even entertained uh, doing a second set of patients. Of course, that's very different than doing technologies with, that we already know what the outcomes will be and it's not gonna be a challenge where you can move on to your phase two after one year and move to your phase three after another year. The other thing is that it really does take time. You know, it takes time, decades to develop these technologies. It really does. Right now, we just, uh, in, you know, started clinical trials and technology that we had been working on for about 20 years. So sometimes it takes several decades to get it right uh, and to make sure that you uh, dot all your I's and cross all your T's. And in terms of the strategy that we have used for autologous cells, that the cells that come from the same patient, we basically went along with that strategy because it was really the, the safest and easiest strategy to go for the patient because safety is paramount. You know, the last thing you want to do is put in a, a technology into a patient that's going to make the patient worse. And so uh, using autologous cells where, you, where if you're trying to, you know, regardless of the organ you're trying to create, you're going to the patient's very own tissue from the same organ so that, you know, that skin cell knows that it's a skin cell and it knows that that's what it's going to make, you know, and it's autologous, so it's not going to reject. Mm -hmm. So all these little features is what makes these cells really uh, more amenable to a first-line clinical therapy. Of course, you know, it doesn't mean that other cells can be used in the future, but there are more challenges to work out if you have a stem cell you have to differentiate, for example. But if you're taking a cell that it already knows it's a, a smooth muscle cell and it knows that that's what it's programmed to do and you don't have to tease it to become another cell type and it's from the same patient and it's not going to reject, well, already you're taking care of so many safety features that are going to be easier for the patient. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a little bit more challenging to do it that way, but at the end of the day, you're assuring uh, patient safety and 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 uh, trying to maximize patient efficacy. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think you and your team at W Firm are living out the dreams of many bioengineers around the world, really developing something that's able to be translated into the clinic. That is, that is the ultimate goal for a lot of folks. And you're living it out. You're living out that dream. And so we talk about tissue engineering all the time on the show, and in particular ways that engineered organs and tissues can be made bigger, better, and actually survive long-term. And the first thing that always seems to come up in terms of limitations is, is vascularization, appropriate vascularization. And we'll talk about the, the vascular tissue challenge in, in a couple of questions down the road, but I wanted to talk about just vascularization in general and how that seems to be lacking for a lot of larger tissue constructs that we hope to put in patients, right? But do you think that's really the key missing link Link to make these advanced tissues and to take these advanced engineered tissues to the next level? Or are there some other critical criteria in addition to vascularization that we seem to be overlooking? That's a great question. And you know, one of the challenges, of course, when we look at tissues is that they're so complex, inherently complex. You know, every tissue is complex, but even within that complexity, you can break it down into its elemental features. So we try to do that as we try to engineer different tissues. You know, we categorize them into basically four groups, flat structures being the least complex. Again, knowing that they're all complex, right? But flat structures like skin are the least complex. And skin in itself is very complex, right? Three layers of tissue, many different cell types, but it's the least complex architecturally. Tubular structures like blood vessels, urethras, heart valves are the second level of complexity. Hollow non-tubular organs, uh, like the bladder, the stomach, they're the third level of complexity because you're 
architecturally it's more complex, the cells are more complex, there's more interaction with other organs. And finally, the most complex, as you inferred with your question, are the solid organs, like the heart, the liver, that require so many more cells per centimeter uh, for the tissue construct itself. And of course, vascularity really becomes a challenge then. And so, but when we think about this in terms of the human body, you know, the reality is that most all our tissues and organs in the body are either flat, tubular, or hollow non-tubular. Only very few organs are actually solid organs. So actually, that's a good thing because it means that we can tackle the flat, tubular, and non-tubular, hollow non-tubular structures uh, much easier because the vascularization challenge there is not as, as large a challenge, right? You're really talking about flat structures that you're shaping in different ways whether it's in a tube or a hollow non-tubular uh, structure. So vascularization in those tissues is not um, as complex to achieve in vivo. And we have many examples of that where it has been, that those tissues can be successfully engineered. When it comes to solid organs, however, different story, right? And as I mentioned, there's so many cells per centimeter where vascularity really becomes a challenge because you have so many more cells to take care of. You just, you know, that's a massive amount of cells that you need to feed. And therefore there are strategies, of course, that uh, many folks are working on and that we have worked on. We're gonna talk a little bit about the vascular tissue challenge. Um, but in reality also, even within a solid organ, you can break that up into different parts so that uh, you can actually try to use alternate strategies to engineer therapies for patients with solid organ disease. And at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. We want to make patients better regardless of the strategy. And of course, there are many strategies we can follow for vascularization. Yeah, so I mean, I know that we're coming from an engineering framework here and, and your trailblazing work has been focused really on laying down the architecture. But the past few years on this show in particular, you know, we talk a lot about organoids and assembloids. It's really been in, in focus uh, in the stem cell field. Um, and it's exciting. Yeah, I mean, for no, for, it's not for no reason that they can demonstrate not only the biological circuitry, but also what I think is interesting, is they demonstrate that the emergence of some, which we all know as developmental biologists, that the emergence of some cell types is really contingent on, on the inductive environment, the cues that are unique to the microenvironment made up by two other cell types, for instance, you know, essentially microenvironment of organ primordia in the embryo creating this whole landscape of cues upon which certain fates are dependent. So I led by saying, I know you're, and you answered the question kind of earlier, talking about how your focus is on cell types that are already terminally differentiated because they know where they are. They know what they are. There's less risk. So I don't need you to, to, to re-answer that. Um, but I, I, I do want to ask if you see that organoids may, may complement the work. You know, I wouldn't say it's an alternative. As you answered, there's a lot. It's a different approach in many ways. Um, but are there lessons to be learned in terms, I mean, you guys are making 40 plus types of tissues. Are there, are those all terminal? Are there some, some lessons to be learned um, for how you can nurture or foster specific fates? Um, are there lessons to be learned from organoids and more undifferentiated stem cell science? Yes, absolutely, Thalen. Uh, another good question, because in reality, you know, we, we tend to forget um, you know, because we are engineering tissues, right? And we come from it from an engineering uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, but we tend to forget that the cells are pre-programmed, you know? And so the question is, how can we make sure that we can maximize the ability of the program to really play itself out? And in, in a way, that's really what we're doing, right? That's really what we're doing for, with tissue engineering, with regenerative medicine, with organoids, body net chip, you know, this whole area where you're reconstituting tissue at its very basic level, at the end of the day, all we're really doing is allowing the cells to do what they're programmed to do to start with, mm. right? Because all of these cells have a, their program, right? It's like push, it's like in a computer, right? You push a button, 
you know that program is going to lead you there and all of a sudden you have Excel open on your computer, right? And so, you know, that's what the cell does, right? It has a program in there and you push a button and that cell's going to become a muscle cell, a normal muscle cell, for goodness sake. How do you make sure that that program is actually activated correctly? You know, you have to make sure the circuits are right. You have to make sure that you have the right RAM, you know, the right memory, the right, you know, that you have the right current going through your computer. It's the same thing, right? You're putting these cells together. You want to make sure they're they're nourished right, that they're going to get the right nutrition, that they're going to have the right cues, that they're going to have the right environment there. So really, it's all about, you know, maximizing the cell's inherent potential, that that's what they're programmed to do. How do you make sure that program can be activated correctly? And therefore, the cells really do play a major role in everything we do. And it's how can we replicate that microenvironment those those cues that are needed to make sure the program runs right. Absolutely, I think perhaps multiple approaches to achieving the same goal of getting functional cells that ultimately you'd be able to uh, use in your constructs and then use for translational purposes. So I think that's the right way to look at it. So now, Dr. Atala, I think we got to talk about the vascular tissue challenge. This is something I've been looking forward to for a long time to chat with you about. So this is the NASA vascular tissue challenge, which you and W firm and multiple teams at W firm were actually a, a part of. And this is something that we were actually both involved with and myself as a, as a judge and yourself as, as a team lead. And just to recap for our listeners, the Vascular Tissue Challenge is a really exciting NASA-sponsored competition whereby teams from around the country strive to be the first to create an advanced vascularized functional 3D tissue construct that could survive for up to a month in which one day could be sent to the International Space Station for research purposes. And W Firm had not one, but two teams that actually won the challenge. So congrats again, and I won't steal your thunder here. So why don't you give a recap of how the teams at W Firm were able to meet this challenge and the approaches you actually used and how excited you are to actually give research on the space station a try. Thank you. And you know, it was exciting working with you through this, by the way, it was just really great. Uh, we enjoyed our sessions together. You as the judge, one of the judges there, you know, always giving us um, feedback and uh, it was really great. And so it's great to see you again in this feed, in this format, right? So uh, uh, as you know, when the vascular challenge came out, we did actually say, okay, well, you know, we, we really ought to try to go for this because this is something that's going to benefit us to, you know, seek these answers uh, that we need to seek. And so basically it was the same team. It was the same team, uh, uh, the same team members, but we took two different approaches. So it's uh, all the same team members, but we decided to go for two different approaches. One approach was, we, and we looked at it, well, how does nature, how's nature doing it? That's really how we went after the approach. So how is nature really vascularizing tissues? And of course there are two major ways that nature vascularizes tissues. One is just the typical way we all think about which is that blood vessel going in and feeding these, the, this capillary network, you know? And so we decided, okay, that's gonna be one approach is this tubular approach where we basically are gonna create tubular structures just like blood vessels. And the second strategy was basically, well, what do other tissues do like, like uh, the liver or, uh, uh, or the corporal bodies uh, uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in, in the human? That's more like spongy tissue, right? Like the spleen, for example. These are spongy tissues where the vascular comes in, but then you're relying on this spongy network of large cavernous areas and cap that, that rely not just on capillaries, but in a sponge-like structure, really. So we went after that, that strategy as well. And, and thankfully, I mean, I tell you got, what, we got extremely lucky because both strategies worked. Uh, we had the same team, uh, different, uh, uh, different people taking uh, different roles in each of the teams, but it was basically the same uh, individuals in each team, uh, in both teams, two different approaches, and we got very lucky. And of course, then it was time to go through the challenge uh, to actually prove that these things work. And, and, and unfortunately, we couldn't do it live this year. We had to do it via Zoom because of COVID. Uh, but it actually worked quite well. 
We enjoyed seeing you during all the Zoom sessions. Um, we enjoyed seeing the folks from NASA and the Methuselah Foundation. And of course, we had to you know, go all around our laps from room to room to show you these things via Zoom. And it mm -hmm. actually made it quite exciting and actually yeah. uh, made it fun. So uh, we were lucky to, to come to a solution and, and we thank NASA and the Methuselah Foundation and uh, you as one of the judges and all the rest of the judges for, for participating in this program. First and second. Wow. I mean, I don't want to enter a competition that you're in, my friend. That's, that's <laughs> tough, tough to do anything. But um, I mean, really, I think you said all credit goes to the team. And uh, you've got a lot of them. You got all these teams at, at W Firm, uh, leading a group of about 400 scientists who said scientists and engineers, diverse specialties, trying to make 40 organs and tissues. I mean, it's a tall order. Um, but maybe a tall order is how do you, you know, wrap your arms around that type of human resources? You know, I can imagine each team is semi-autonomous and they really are brilliant minds leading the science on their own. But you kind of have to have a managing hand on the whole, right? How do you do that? Well, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I mentioned the mission, right? We, and, and one of the things that I have found is that you cannot talk about the mission often enough, right? And the mission, as I mentioned, is really improve patients' lives through regenerative medicine. So it's a very simple formula, really, which is, that is, what, are, is what you're doing really going to be relevant to a patient someday? And uh, sometimes we forget, right? Because we, we, all of us as scientists, just love to, you know, just love to uncover things and discover things and, you know, leave no stone unturned, but at the end of the day, we have to be focused. And the focus is okay. It is hard enough to get these technologies into patients. So you gotta know everything there is to know to make sure they're safe. So, you know, and of course there are all these tangents that you can go into all these different directions you can go into, but you have to stay focused. So that's the number one thing is stay focused on the mission to make sure that the things that we work on truly ha can have an impact in patients in the future. Uh, the second one is really, you know, the, the core values that we espouse at W Firm. And our core values are very simple, really. Uh, they're basically innovation. That's one of the core values, innovation. So we're constantly being challenged to innovate uh, and to think differently. You know, how can we solve this puzzle in different ways? Because typically, as you know, the body biologically is very redundant. It has many multiple ways that it solves the puzzle, right? You shut off one pathway, there are three more pathways ready to take you in the same direction. So the body is very redundant. So the fact is there are many, many answers to the same question. So you have to be able to innovate, think differently, answer the questions differently. The second core value is teamwork. Because, you know, this idea of siloed work where you, you know, you had all the answers, you know, that was a really, really a good way to do it, you know, uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago when information did not flow as easily. But look at how information is flowing today. There's absolutely no way we can keep up with the volumes of information and data that's being generated in biology every single day. Um, and so it does take a team. Not one person can be an expert in everything. So that's where you need different people who are experts in what they do, who can really do deep dives. So teamwork where people are all working together and pulling together in the same direction is critical. And finally, the third core value is integrity. Integrity, because at the end of the day, you have to trust your teammates. You have to trust that what you're gonna, that the foundation that you're using is gonna be solid enough to get to the next level. It's like mountain climbing, right? You have to have the right team in place. You cannot have folks that are not gonna do the right thing because it can be life-threatening. And it's the same thing with these technologies. You have to have integrity in everything you do. So keeping our mission, keeping our mission, which is to improve patients' lives through regenerative medicine and our core values, innovation, teamwork, and integrity are really key to getting to where you want to go. And that helps our team move forward. Absolutely. And you have a tremendous team that you've built out over the years at W Firm. And I want to go back to the beginning 
in, in a few ways. I want to go back to the beginning of the conversation and the beginning of your time at W Firm. So we talked about your backstory and, you know, we, you moved from the behemoth that is the Harvard Medical School to Wake Forest in the 2000s to set up W Firm. And Wake Forest in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, has always been known as an excellent medical institution. Dalen and I actually know this pretty well after spending some time at a rival school just down the road in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, but what you, I was, I was just wondering, what did you see in Wake Forest um, that uh, back then in the early 2000s made you think that this would be a perfect place to set up a world-class program in regenerative medicine and tissue engineering? And what do you love about the place today? You know, it's interesting. You know, of course, I love being in Boston. You know, Harvard was a great place. It was a great institution. And many people say that, you know, what, why did you, well, you know, I realized that really, um, you know, in Boston, you have all these different hospitals that are, you know, connected together. But if you needed to do a clinical trial, you needed to go through uh, various IRBs, various approval processes as each hospital. Each hospital had its own, its own, uh, its own uh, rules and regulations, all, you know, run by a single medical school, but different institutions in terms of hospitals. And what I realized was that, I, it, it, you know, you really needed an environment where it was going to make it, you know, from a, from a paperwork standpoint, it's going to be easier to do in a place where, um, a place where the, not just the university is, is uh, rooting for you, but the city and the state is also important. And, you know, North Carolina is the third place for biotech in the whole nation. So California is ranked number one just because of its sheer size. Massachusetts is ranked number two, but Ca North Carolina is ranked number three nationwide. And there's a lot of there were a lot of advantages there because North Carolina, for the last several decades, the last two decades, uh, each decade it has been the the sec the uh, largest growing sector of all three states has been North Carolina in terms of biotechnology. So biotechnology it keeps growing here by leaps and bounds. So you had an environment where you had the institution really focused on making sure that technologies would succeed, a city that would be able to support it, the state was going to be supportive, and biotechnology truly is one of the major pushes for North Carolina, not to mention the fact that the cost of living here is great. As you know, um, in a survey of 300 cities worldwide, Winston-Salem comes in typically number one in terms of low cost of living. Uh, you know, it's not a hassle to recruit people here. We can recruit the best and the brightest because the cost of living here is so low and people can just live five minutes from work, 10 minutes from work and have a family. And you don't have the challenges of living in a city like Boston to do that. So you can really recruit folks later in their careers as well, which is needed, right? Because Boston tends to attract the young and the restless. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but once you have a family, it's a tougher place to stay. So, um, so uh, that also was helpful. Uh, and the fact that it's just such a great place to be, you know, um, as you know, here, we're close to the ocean, we're close to the mountains, we're close to lakes, we're close to everywhere, and it's just a great place to live. So quality of life is also important, uh, as well as the, uh, the institutional support that is critical to make things move forward, and finally, city and state support. So it really felt like the right combination of things all coming together. And we never regretted it. You know, as you know, we moved our whole, uh, we moved uh, uh, pretty much our entire team here. Um, and it's been great for all of us to be here. Man, I mean, hearing you talk about it, I, I left Carolina when I graduated Duke. But if you had been there, I might have, I might have stayed. I mean, you make such a good, I, I loved Carolina. I mean, Rune and I talk about it all the time. It was such a mm -hmm. great time in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, in our case, being at Duke, but it was just being down there, the whole atmosphere, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, but they're so tech savvy and tech forward at the research triangle. So I, everything you said there, I would uh, echo. Um, it, you know, it really is, and I have to, of course, to also say the weather, right? I mean, oh, man. no, no tra sure. and the traffic, no traffic hassles. The weather is just amazing. You enjoy the seasons. It's just a great place. You gotta stop oh. talking right now. I'm about to go out into the disgusting New York heat. Just please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting upset. Um, all right, next and final question before we get to some peripheral. I just want to say, I mean, I imagine I, I have, you know, I think every scientist before they've made their big uh, splash has a little bit of a fantasy of like, ah, 
wait till they see, you know, and I, I think for you, uh, it must be very gratifying to see the work that many dismissed as science fiction are being so far out, uh, becoming a reality, not just in your hands out of your group, but it's been widely adopted. Um, but of course, you know, things never proceed as we predict or imagine. What, what, what have been the greatest surprises uh, over the last couple of decades that, that you wouldn't have predicted? And if I can put you on the spot, uh, what would you predict for the next couple of decades in, in your field? Yeah, thank you. The nice question. You know, really the, the best surprise for us has been that these technologies are in fact benefiting patients. I mean, you know, you think it's like, it's like, you know, uh, Arun said initially, right? It's this daunting task of bringing something to the clinic. It is daunting. I mean, it really is, right? I mean, you, you have no idea, you know, it's, it's just nerve wracking, right? When you're finally going to put this thing into a patient and, and you have absolutely no idea. Of course, you know that it's worked time and time again in your in your preclinical models, but now it's a human, you know, and there's a life at stake. So it, and so really for us, the biggest reward, the biggest reward really is making sure that these things do work on patients and it makes their lives better. I mean, that's just really no feeling that replaces that. Um, and in terms of the future for us, it's really how can we keep translating technologies, but how can we keep, how can we scale up the production of the technologies so we can automate the process and make it a lower cost, faster and better. And that's really where the field is headed. You know, looking at the future standardization of the field to make sure we can produce these products and produce them at a scale up level that'll make it affordable for everybody. Industrial scale, organogenesis. I mean, I, that's uh, that's makes it sound like crazy sci-fi, but I think that's what we're talking about here. It's very exciting. Um, thank you so much for sharing all that. I just I'm going to ask you to share a couple more, uh, maybe more personal and science peripheral uh, factoids for the listeners, if you will. First, um, if you could answer any scientific question, regardless of your expertise or chosen field, what would it be? You know, uh, definitely, I would love to find out how we could stop cells from going bad. You know, in terms of how can we stop cells from becoming cancer cells? And, and of course, you know, that's, that was a worry for us in RegenMed initially, right? Are these cells going to turn into tumor cells? We now know that's not the case because we have now, you know, many, many technologies in patients. Because if you start out with normal cells, you're going to end up with normal cells. But it doesn't mean, but you know, here we're, we're still dealing with, with, um, with a cancer everywhere you go. And those are basically cells going rogue, hmm. right? That's what it is. Cells going rogue. Right. And so how can we, and if we can engineer normal tissues, which we can, how can we make sure that we can somehow protect cells in the future from ever going rogue? Not just for the tissues that we engineer, but for patients in general. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the holy grail, right? And not just cancer, right? But age, age is, is cells going bad. I think it's interesting because the best scientists we talk to on this show and in general, they wish for the thing that would put them out of a job. And I think it's funny, if you didn't, if cells didn't go bad, then you wouldn't be such an amazing innovator. But that is the best among us, I think, wish for uh, unemployment, if it meant uh, saving all those lives, right? <laughs> That's right. Next question. And last, uh, what is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to resolve? You know, the biggest misconception is that people, you know, when these things do come out, people think this stuff is easy and that it, you know, and that it's, that it, that is fast. And so the biggest misconception of science is that, you know, because they see something that it works in a mouse model, you know, here comes this paper, it works in a mouse. Oh my gosh, this is going to be in patients tomorrow. And they don't realize just the fact that it works in the mouse. You have 20 years ahead of you before you even start thinking that it's going to work in a human. So I guess, you know, the biggest misconception in science is that it's easy. The science is not easy. It's hard. It's years of labor to get it to where it needs to be. But that's also what makes it exciting, mm -hmm. right? Because we're constantly solving the puzzle. We're constantly solving the puzzle to try to put it all together. So basically making sure that people realize that, um, you know, early, uh, early animal studies don't really mean, uh, you know, early uh, lab studies don't really mean that that's a cure. And that even if it were, it's going to take decades to get there. It really does take time to get these technologies to where they need to be. 
Right. I know someone had said it to me. This is the, uh, and I know this is not, this is more the kids, but it probably applies for the young scientists too, that they're the, the prime generation referencing Amazon Prime. They want everything in two to three days. But, um, you know, it's a testament, I think, to your tremendous patience and rigor that all the young scientists of today are, are in, enjoying the fruits of, of uh, that hard, hard work over such a long time. Uh, Dr. Aital, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. This has been a really, really fun chat for us. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Been fun being with you. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or by email at info at stemcellpodcast.com. There you can give us feedback or to suggest guests, probably not many better than this episode. So fun talking to Anthony Atella. Thanks again for joining us and listening. Come back to us in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm.